Huss. Now, I've spelled his name John, J-A-N, the way that it's uh, most authentic. Sometimes books about Huss or writings about Huss will anglicize the spelling of his name and spell it J-O-H-N, John. He was a Czech from what would be now uh, Czechoslovakia. In those days, it was uh, Bohemia. He was ordained a, a Catholic priest in 1401. And he spent much of his career teaching at Charles University in Prague, Bohemia, uh, and preaching at the Bethlehem Chapel near the university. He was early on influenced by Wycliffe. Actually, Wycliffe being, first of all, a philosophical writer and later a theological writer, John Huss had encountered Wycliffe's philosophical writings during his, his years of being educated when he was in college. But when he became a minister... Uh, he became uh, enamored with Wycliffe's theological writings. And he obviously picked up a lot of them. In fact, uh, many church historians would just represent John Huss as, as sort of a, a Wycliffe clone, that he just kind of bought Wycliffe's ideas of whole cloth and just promoted them in Bohemia. To a certain extent, he did that, but modern historians are saying uh, Huss had his own thoughts and he was his own thinker. And, you know, he did agree with Wycliffe on many things, but he had his own direction he took also. One of the things that happened at this time was that, if I recall, the English prince married the Bohemian princess at this time. And that opened up uh, relations between the two countries, uh, friendly relations between the countries. And uh, the Lollards, the Wycliffeites, were able to bring their ideas into Bohemia, where uh, John Huss was able to encounter them at that time. He emphasized personal piety, which is godliness. And purity of life. Everyone agrees he was heavily indebted to the writings of Wycliffe, and he stressed the authority of Scripture and raised the preaching of the Bible to an important part in the church service. And again, he believed in preaching in the vernacular of the people. He wrote uh, a very important book, usually considered to be his most important book, was called On the Church, or in other words, About the Church. And he defined the church as Christ's body, having only Christ as its head. Of course, this is radically different than what the Roman Catholic Church would say, uh, but very much like what the Waldensians had said and what Wycliffe had said also. He defended the role of the clergy, himself being a clergyman, but he did teach that only God could forgive sins, and that's different than what the Catholic Church taught about the clergy. They taught that the priest can absolve sins. And uh, John has said, no, only, only God can do that. He taught that no church authority could establish doctrine contrary to Scripture and that Christians should not obey orders that were unscriptural from the church. So in that respect, he was a sola scriptura kind of a guy and very very much would be at odds with the Catholic Church even today if he were here now, for the same reasons that some of us would be. He criticized several things in the Catholic Church. He criticized the corruption of the clergy, which was widespread. He criticized the worship of images, a widespread practice in the Catholic Church. He criticized the making of superstitious pilgrimages. People thought that if they made pilgrimages to holy sites, this would give them brownie points with God. And he said, that's not, that's silly. Um, He was against the sale of indulgences. And he was against the practice, very common in the Catholic Church, of withholding the cup from the people. Now, in the... uh, Catholic Mass, the worshipers there are permitted to take the wafer, but only the priest, I guess, drinks from the cup. I'm not that familiar with the Catholic liturgy, but the the people were allowed to have the bread, but not the wine. And uh, he, he opposed this. He believed that uh, they should take both. If they're going to take communion, they should get both. And that was uh, one of his big, uh, his big complaints with the Catholic practice. The Archbishop of Prague, where Huss lived and taught, Encouraged by the Pope to stamp out the spread of Wycliffe's teachings, excommunicated John Huss. But the excommunication of Huss did not meet with popular support. John Huss had become something of a national hero. Uh, from what I've read from several sources, I'm not entirely clear what, what caused him to, except that his preaching was uh, well received. And people really thought highly of him. And so when the Pope excommunicated Huss, Uh, the Bohemian people in Prague just didn't accept it. They were very furious against the church. So Huss 
was emboldened by this to keep coming out against the Pope and against the Catholic Church. He came out strongly against the Pope's sale of indulgences, a move that cost him the support of his uh, King Wenceslas. You ever heard about good King Wenceslas? Well, that was the King of Bohemia who uh, supported Huss up to a point. But when Huss began to oppose the sale of indulgences, uh, the, the reason this particular sale of indulgences at the time was uh, to support the Pope's war against the King of Naples. And uh, I don't know all the politics that were involved with that, but Wenceslas didn't, uh, didn't agree with Huss on that and ceased to support Huss at that time on that point. Now, the city came under a papal interdict. Now, do you remember a papal interdict means that the Pope just says that none of the sacraments we ministered in a city, in a particular city. And in the Catholic Church, if you don't take the sacraments, you go to hell. Uh, so, I mean, you need the, 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 the Pope's approved men the, the the ordained clergy to offer the sacraments because if you if they don't and you don't if you're excommunicated and you can't do that then you go to hell so to put the whole city under interdict was to actually withdraw the sacraments from the whole city and of course that would be a punishment of the whole city that would that would scare a lot of superstitious people and the Catholics uh, t- tended to be pretty superstitious people the people can't be really blamed that much. They were mostly probably illiterate. They didn't have Bibles. They didn't know anything except what the church told them. And their ancestors had been Catholic for many generations. So, I mean, they just, the only religious ideas they had were those that the church allowed them to have. So, being superstitious is just part of being a Roman Catholic about some of these things, even still. So, when, when the Pope put the whole, the whole town of, the city of Prague under the interdict, uh, that really kind of cost us the support that he had enjoyed in the city. They didn't all want to be under the interdict. So he went off and uh, was exiled to southern Bohemia. Now, when the Council of Constance was coming up, uh, he he actually was reluctant to go to it, but he had some friends who thought he should go to this church council, the Ecumenical Council, and to present his views there because they thought he had good views. And he was reluctant because he knew that if he went to uh, you know, a council where the Pope was, uh, he'd just probably be uh, fall victim to the Inquisition because he'd been criticizing the Pope so much. However, the Emperor gave him a promise of safe conduct. So he traveled there hoping to present his views to the assembled authorities of the church. But once he got there, the safe conduct was revoked and he found himself tried in the Inquisition and condemned. Actually, they, uh, in the Inquisition... All you needed was enough witnesses to say that you that you have taught certain things, and then you have two choices. If the things that, if there's witnesses that say you've taught bad things, you can either confess it and repent, and you'll go to life imprisonment, or you can deny it, or admit it and not repent and go to the stake and be burned. And uh, those are the two options open to somebody who was condemned by the Inquisition. Well, he was condemned. Actually, he was condemned of doctrines he never taught because the witnesses that witnessed against him lied. But he was imprisoned uh, in Constance for eight months before he was put to death. When he protested that he had been traveling under safe conduct from the emperor, uh, they were told that promises made to heretics don't count. And so they they had uh, deceived him into thinking he'd be safe if he came and said they'd lured him to his death. Uh, He was burned at the stake. July 6, 1415. But uh, the Hussite movement continued in Bohemia. Eventually, those who were influenced by Huss were called the Bohemian Brethren. And at a later date, still, they're called the Moravian Brethren. After the time of the Reformation, the Moravians, during the Thirty Year War, uh, had to flee from Moravia and they fled to Germany. And their story is an exciting one. Uh, there was a revival. The Holy Spirit came down on them. We'll talk about this later when we get to that period. It was in the 1700s. The Holy Spirit came down on this whole community. It started a prayer meeting that lasted nonstop for 100 years. And they ended up starting the modern missions movement. Sometimes William Carey is considered to be the father of the modern missions movement. Before he did it, uh, the, the Moravians were sending missionaries all over the world. St- the Moravian church still exists. Um, but they were basically the, the uh, heirs of the Hussite movement in Bohemia. In Bohemia, where Huss had lived, the movement was still strong for a long time after his death, but uh, the Habsburgs conquered the area in 1620, and they reestablished Catholicism in that area. The Hussites were numerous. They were then suppressed at that time in Bohemia. (laughs) 